Hey everyone, welcome to Being Well. I'm Forrest Hansen. If you're new to the podcast, this is where we explore the practical science of personal growth. And if you've listened before, welcome back. I'm joined today, as usual, by Dr. Rick Hansen. Rick is an author, a clinical psychologist, and he's also my dad. So dad, how are you doing today? I'm good. And honestly, just looking at that question in the present, I can truly say, Forrest, one of the absolute highlights of my day is when I get to do this with you. Oh, well, that's very sweet, Dad. I really appreciate that. Well, it's a good setup for our topic today, which is recognizing good inside ourselves. And here, and what do you do when somebody recognizes good in, your, in you, right? And here I am, <laughs> live, recognizing good in you. And it's really a good that we co-create. And certainly you're a major source of it, the major source of it, really, since you run the podcast. And what do you do suddenly when your attention is turned to something factually good inside yourself? Yeah, well, that's really sweet for Starter's Dad, and I appreciate it. And it's also a great introduction for what we're going to be talking about today. And a little while ago, we posted an episode on self-awareness that we got really positive feedback about. And a key part of that conversation was an interaction that we had where you emphasized how, for most people, much of what there is to become more aware of inside of ourselves is our positive aspects, like the good news that there is to find. And if you missed that episode, here's a cut-down version of that short clip. Also, a lot of the time, what we become aware of is good news. Like, I'll ask you, is there anything that you got in touch with through self-awareness that for you was reassuring, a relief, good news? I don't know. I'm not totally sure how to answer that question, to be honest. Maybe I'm just wrong about this. I, I don't feel like that's where the pain points are for people. I think the pain points are around dealing with things that they need to change, not embracing like positive aspects of their personality. But that's maybe because that's where the pain points are for me. I'll, I'll definitely say my clinical experience, 80% of what there is for people to recognize about themselves is good news ish on average maybe 20 percent is how they could be more skillful oh wow, really yeah really man that's now really in my clinic that's my clinical population but that's totally yeah. my experience that interaction was really helpful for me personally and i thought that it made sense for us to essentially have a follow-up episode where we focus on what people can do to become more aware of and connect with their positive aspects including dealing with some of the natural blocks that emerge inside of people to feeling good about ourselves so does that sound good to you we're already in it. Awesome. So before we get started, a few quick reminders. First, please subscribe to the podcast if you haven't already through whatever you're listening to it right now on. And then second, if you'd like to support us in other ways, you can find us on Patreon. It's patreon.com slash being well. So to follow up on that introduction, Dad, if most of what there is for us to become more self-aware of is our positive aspects, what we do well, our good nature, positive impulses, good traits that we have inside of ourselves, then it stands to reason that there's something that's getting in the way of that. And what do you think gets in the way of people really hearing the good news about themselves? Boy, several things just really stand right out. First is the very strong psychic gravitational pull of shame, feelings of inadequacy, self-doubt, self-criticism, uh, anxiety about incapacity. The What I mean by that is this feeling that we're smaller than our challenges. We're weaker than the forces arrayed against us. And so th that material has a strong pull. Not to be clear, sometimes there are aspects in that material that are factually based. Maybe there are things that it's appropriate to be ashamed of or to have guilt or remorse about. There are certainly things for myself that, wow, every time I think about it, I just, ugh, you know, I feel bad about it. I should feel bad about it. It's okay that I feel bad about it. Also, sometimes we appraise ourselves and we recognize, boy, I really am being outgunned these days. I really am smaller or weaker than these negative forces coming at us. All right, there's a place for that. But much of that is wrong. It's based on the negativity bias in which we overlearn from episodes, especially when we're children, of being smaller than the forces around us. And also, um, we can uh, be 
caught up in um, a culture that tells us that it's not okay to really recognize our strengths. So that's one part of it. Second part of it that I see is that for many people, their interior is a great mystery to them. They don't have much sense of what's underneath it all. And because they don't have much sense of what's underneath it all, they don't have much sense of the capabilities there, the talents, the virtues, the efforts, and deep, deep, deep down, a fundamental natural goodness in just about everybody. So those are some of the reasons why. Yeah, I think that a part of that that you alluded to there in terms of our early experiences, where we have these authentic experiences of the world yeah. being bigger and stronger and scarier in a lot of mm -hmm. different ways uh, than we are, and we internalize them. And one way that that can show up for people is the stories that they hear mm -hmm. from the people around them, uh, yeah. particularly from parents or caregivers, authority figures, other kids at school, whatever where we get told, and I have a lot of uh, empathy and sympathy for this, because I think this is very much attached to my own personal story, where we get told that we're a certain kind of way, and we internalize that certain kind of way as part of our self-identity, because kids are lumps of clay, and the adults know, and we don't, and if you have that kind of an orientation, which certainly I did as a kid, you go, okay, that must be how I am. And so one of the personal stories that I took on was very much the story about being very cognitive, very much a knower, not really a feeler, all of that kind of content. Um, and over time, that got very much attached to my own story. And that's not purely negative, but there were certainly some negative aspects of that that I really, really oriented toward. And I didn't orient toward so much the very positive aspects of being a sensitive, emotional touchy-feely kind of person that I really think I am sort of deep down. And so because I internalized that story, I got cut off from those more positive tendencies, and I really had to rediscover them in adulthood. Well, as a parent, you know, that's poignant to me. And one thing that motivates me on this topic, Forrest, is that I think it's incredibly important at this moment in history to recognize the good in other people at a whole other level, particularly the people who are, quote unquote, not like me. Yeah, It's so important to recognize the good in other people. It doesn't mean overlooking the bad, doesn't mean overestimating their capabilities. Uh, it's not about positive thinking, it's about clear seeing. And the truth is, I think, <laughs> here I am, Mr. You know, seeing the good. Most people suck at recognizing the good in others, let alone mm. acknowledging it. So I think that's a very important thing to do. And one of the things that can help us be better at that for all kinds of pro-social purposes, you know, that will ripple out and affect the whole world, one way into that is to get better at recognizing the good in yourself and standing up for it. I grew up in a way in which my parents were loving and decent, but I felt like they were seeing someone that was displaced from the real me by about a foot to the side. Hmm. And it's deeply unnerving to feel unseen, particularly important parts of yourself. It's very wounding to be unseen. And as a repair for the ways in which others, maybe while growing up and even in the current time, don't see us clearly, at least we can see ourselves clearly, right? Like, for example, um, I was reflecting recently on what I was like when I was nine years old. And I actually made that the basis for one of my talks in this online meditation gathering I do, which is sort of Buddhisty and- Wednesday night, we'll link to it in the description oh, of good. the podcast yeah. episode. Thanks for plugging that, Dad. I actually intended to plug that during the introduction, I forgot to. Yeah. And just, it's not something you would normally think of as a so-called Dharma talk. You know, what was it like sure. to be you when you were nine? What were you like mm. when you were nine? And it's so interesting, because when I look back at what I was like when I was nine, I skipped a grade, I was young, I was scrawny, you know, I was like kind of shying off to the side. But you know what? I was determined. I was a cool little kid. I was reading a lot, I was thinking about a lot of stuff. You know, I had my inner world, I was nice. I, I thought about the kids who were being bullied. I, I tried to help them, you know, I stepped up for them. Uh, I, you know, not a perfect kid, I'm sure, and not better than other nine-year-olds, but just, you know, that kid was pretty cool. Here I am, I'm 69. I'm talking about something 60 years ago and it moved me in an important way to reclaim a sense of myself, the roots of myself, the core of myself, let's say as a nine-year-old kid. Like, wow, 
that's really helpful to do. In my 20s, I started playing intramural athletics and beginning to do rock climbing. And I realized that I was not a terrible athlete. I was probably a B plus athlete, but definitely not mm. a C minus athlete. Just that. Wow. You know, that was really good for me. And people listening might think to themselves, what's cool about yourself as a nine-year-old that <laughs> you could recognize? Uh, what are some of the myths you've bought into about yourself? that you could debunk? And you know, what are some of the uh, surprisingly cool things about you? Talent, skills, virtues, good-heartedness, lovingness, that would be really good to own up to. Yeah, do you think that you were able to really, I'm trying to find the right way to put this. Uh, so you, you, there was a way you were when you were that age. There was a way you were when you were nine, when yeah. you had all of these positive traits. And now you're talking about going back as an adult and essentially reconnecting with those positive traits in different ways. Do you think that you had a, a continuous experience of that as being positive aspects of yourself? Or did you kind of lose touch with those aspects, maybe as a teenager or early in your 20s, and you had to kind of go back later and refine them? That's great. I, I think I lost touch. Um, I, I think I lost touch too. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and there's something about this that's about surprise. Mm. For example, when we see something in another person, like you, I'll use you <laughs> for science here. Uh, you know, your your lead some of your leading qualities, you you are analytic. Uh you played poker in college, uh in professionally, you put yourself through college a couple of three years. You know, based on that, you were, instead of playing the stock market, you played the old guys <laughs> played other like people. online and you just kept harvesting money from them. <laughs> Good on you. They knew what they were in for. <laughs> for them, it was entertaining. For you, it was a living. <laughs> Everyone was a consenting participant. Yeah, totally. <laughs> anyway, long stories. So you lead with that. But then to have a person kind of go, well, Forrest, you know, behind that rationalist, uh, play the odds, cool, detached thing. You're an incredibly sweet, kind, loving person who has a compulsion for justice. <laughs> <laughs> a compulsion for justice. I like that. That was that was a good way to put that, Dad. I mean, put in the uh, the positive aspects of it and the problematic ones that pop up sometimes. Yeah, every once and in they a have while. that recognized. Yeah. Right? Totally. Like, whoa, what, like, what's the do to you right now to have that recognized? Flip it around. Can we give ourselves that recognition? Yeah, yeah, totally. And, and, and it's two parts, right? On the one hand, I think that there is something in being seen by other people in the positive traits that we feel are under acknowledged about ourselves that is like extremely reparative and very like, yeah, you know, and you just lean into it in a different kind of way. And maybe this is just me, but I actually think this is a lot of people, there's also something about it where you can feel very exposed because this is often a very private part of people. Like the the parts of ourselves, yeah, I'm struggling for the language here, but it's like the, there are these vulnerable parts of ourselves. They're often very young mm. to use the language of IFS. You know, we have these younger parts inside of ourselves and and they can be a little bit more, more, um, more sensitive in a variety of different ways. And connecting with them can feel really lovely, but it can also feel very exposed. And there's this kind of dance there where there's a part of me that goes, oh, I don't know, this is getting a little vulnerable. And there's also a part of me that's like, wow, really hungering to be seen in that way. And I think that that dance is one of the things that, that gets in the way of people connecting with their more positive aspects, really, because there's that sensitivity and that vulnerability associated with the process. Yeah. There's also yeah. something powerful. When somebody sees something in us, that we had not really seen in ourselves. And it, and it can give you permission to see it, totally. Yeah. Yeah. And to name it, right? And this gets a little tricky related, for example, to uh, an episode we did recently with, with my friend, Ron Siegel, psychologist, teaches at Harvard, wrote this beautiful book. The Extraordinary Gift of Being Ordinary. Yeah. Right. And it's also true that each of us is has characteristics that are on a distribution. And we have characteristics that are toward the tail of the curve, that are at the high end of the curve in certain regards. We all have these characteristics uh, in which routinely 
we're just the best person in the room, almost always, at that particular thing. It might be flavoring the spaghetti sauce or being able to really tune into a, a troubled cat or dog or <laughs> toddler or fix hair, whatever it might be, right? Or to, uh, you know, and so forth. Uh, have a gift of language, be able to be a little poetical, something, something. To have those qualities acknowledged in us, just, it's beautiful. It's a really, mm. it's high impact. So I think a lot about uh, gifting. What are the social gifts that we can so easily give other people in a very sincere way, the, the offering of the valuing of others? What a powerful gift. And there's a term in developmental psychology, prizing where appropriately children need to feel prized. Now there's skillful prizing and unskillful prizing and people have pointed out in research that if we prize kids a lot for the results, then they can get kind of attached to the results rather than prizing them for process and having a growth mindset and so forth. But boy, don't you wanna feel prized? The world is scary. It's hard. A lot of people are mean. You know, they're kind of jerks. They're not prizing you. They're devaluing you. How beautiful, isn't it, to prize other people? Yeah. And I think that that is just such a great way to support people in reconnecting mm. with those, those banished aspects of their self, right? Because a lot of the time, what happens is that we have these these qualities mm -hmm. that look really good in adulthood yeah. that get essentially punished out of us in childhood. And an example of that might be a really high degree of emotional sensitivity, which looks wonderful in a relationship partner, but is not always rewarded on the playground with other kids. And so we learn to neuter those impulses inside of ourselves so we don't get punished when we're children. Um, but the lesson that we learned back then becomes problematic a lot of the time in the here and now. Um, and so reconnecting with those aspects as an adult can feel like, it can feel scary because we've learned that there is a punishment associated with that part of ourselves. And I think just a beautiful way through that is other people taking a role in supporting us in that process by doing that prizing that you're talking about, Dad. So can can I practice on you? Would you be willing to yeah. do this? A little, you know, it won't sure. be too weird, but experiential. Well, all right. All right. So these are three questions that people can ask themselves, or they can think about this with regard to somebody else. So one has to do with good intentions. Mm -hmm. Good intentions. So for you, Forrest, mm -hmm. I could ask, what's one of your good intentions? Uh I think. I have a strong intention to do good work. And maybe I'm just thinking about it because we're doing the podcast right now, but I really care about it. Like I want it to be good. Um, and I don't just want it to be good out of like a narcissistic, you know, I want to be associated with a good thing kind of thing. Although I'm sure some of that comes in there as well. I, I mean, in terms of like, I actually really care about giving people like good information and really vetting it and being very thorough and, and not not making a mistake um, in a way that could be problematic or harmful. So that's an example. Wonderful the way you put it. It yeah. reminds me of Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. Uh, mm -hmm. We're going to do an episode someday about books. Yes, and that it's been in the be hopper for a while. The, yeah, for many people, that's been a seminal book. And yeah. you know, the key word in it is quality, the seeking mm. of quality, whether you're mm. maintaining a motorcycle or raising a child or engaging your own awakening process or supporting a podcast, you know, the seeking of quality. How about you, dad? Oh, that's sweet. Um, I wasn't ready for that. That's great. Good for you. <laughs> I, I definitely have a strong learning intention. You know, I, I intend to learn. I'm, I'm very inclined toward learning. And that's an intention. Value is close to intention. I love to learn. You know, I'm a student. Okay, here's another question. So intentions, mm -hmm. and these are things for people to reflect on themselves, maybe. Talents, something that you are naturally, inherently really quite good at, innately. What's one of your talents? Well, I think this is where I start to bump into some of my content, which is gonna be a good topic transition for us at some point. But um, I think I've always had a, had a 
talking capability. I've always been pretty verbally gifted um, with like words and writing and stringing a sentence together. Uh, it, it often, but not always, comes through on the podcast. <laughs> that I'm certainly a very chatty person. Um, so yeah, so that's something that I feel a real a real positive uh, quality associated with. So if I were to answer it, and there there are different kinds of you know talents. Um, I have a talent with little kids. Hmm. I'm very comfortable with them. I'm fascinated yeah. by them. I'm I'm safe with them. There's a energy. A lot of your work was with kids. Yeah, yeah. that's right. So you could call that a talent. You know, I I'd be a good preschool teacher. Yeah, yeah, totally. <laughs> So people can ask themselves, what are their talents? What are they innately good at? Skills are different. Skills are acquired. Talents are innate. And there are different kinds of talents. For example, sensing who in the room is hurting mm -hmm. or having a feeling for yeah. beauty or orderliness, aesthetics. That's a talent. Many, many kinds of talents. Here's another one. Third one. Efforts. Where do people make efforts, honorable efforts, you know, including... Just the effort to endure really, really horrible conditions. Well, I think that I've made a a, a major effort around, and again, we're we're bumping into a little bit of my content here, uh, which will be useful to talk about. But I think that I I started with a lot of advantages, um, but regardless, I've made a very dedicated effort to deal with my own material um, inside of myself and to peel back some of the negative tendencies, the problematic tendencies, maybe a better word, that I developed particularly in like my late teenage, early 20 years, um, that were really just getting in the way of my relationships with other people and have made a very dedicated effort over the past five to 10 years to, to work on them in a, in a thoughtful and consistent kind of way. Um, so that's an area where even more so than like consistent work effort or something like that, I, I feel good about that. Um, cause I think that a lot of people just don't do that. Um, and so, yeah, so that, that's, I think a good example. That's great. If I would pick one, when I'm in a situation in which there's a wrangle with another person and mm -hmm. maybe they have a criticism for me or there's, there's an issue between us after I finish <laughs> spewing or being a little reactive <laughs> in the beginning or, <laughs> you know, or righteous, you know, captured by my own righteousness. I'm very reliable to strongly make an effort to, uh, to clarify my own correction. How can I do better next time? What can I learn? How can we repair here? In including what are the takeaways for me for the future? It kind of goes to learning as, as an intention. How could I do better? Uh, you know, that's that's a pretty good effort. To offer some commentary on our commentary, I think that that's, for starters, totally true. I've seen you do it many times. And this isn't intended as an exercise and, and two guys praising themselves. <laughs> um, it's intended as a way in for ways that you, who are listening right now, can do this exercise with yourself. And also, I think that a really, really useful part of listening to this process is listening to the bumpiness associated with it. I've been bumpy during this, as you might be able to tell as a listener, I've certainly felt bumpy internally. And a lot of what has created my bumpiness has been me bumping into my own material, um, and particularly material associated with being pretty hypersensitive to coming across as um, narcissistic, conceited, entitled, uh, not offering sufficient appreciation for the ways in which I had a, an easier run of it than many other people did. All of that stuff. And so whenever I start to do any kind of a process, I've noticed particularly around like traits, because kind of efforts or intentions, like, okay, that's stuff you're doing out in the world. But traits, I think, is tough for people a lot of the time. And particularly, I think, for, for people who have any kind of a self-help orientation, which almost everyone listening to this podcast probably does, uh, because you receive so much messaging about don't be conceited, don't be a narcissist. And narcissism in general is like a big hot button word uh, these days in the culture. So what do you think helps people kind of get through that, Dad, in terms of connecting with these positive aspects without, while well, dealing with like the cringe of like, oh, am I being too 
am I being too conceited here? Am I being too pumping myself up in some kind of inappropriate way? I've grappled with that a lot because I had a lot yeah. of inadequacy, you know, and, mm. and feeling small, less, weak. So I'll just name a few things that people can relate to. So one is the value on just seeing the truth. All right, see your warts, see your room for improvement, and also see your virtuous efforts. See your talents, see your character virtues, see where you are progressing and developing. It's about seeing the truth. It's not about praise or blame. It's about clear seeing. And that's a way in here. Second is to appreciate that it's justice. Much as it is unjust to inaccurately criticize others or to systematically exclude their positive qualities, that would be unjust to them in terms of our social appraisals of others. So we want to see people clearly. That's just. And in much the same way, there's justice in seeing yourself clearly. Third, to help yourself get through it, is to realize that for you, it's therapeutic. You know, how many of us are carrying around a, kind, a, a, a deeply invested arrogance and superiority well, way too many, <laughs> you know, especially <laughs> who come from families of privilege. Sure. And um, yeah. you can just think about people, as the line puts it, born on third base who think they hit a home run, right? Sure. Yeah. Born with a silver spoon in their mouth. And, and um, okay, on the other hand, most people err toward feelings of inadequacy, self-criticism, carrying a lot of shame, self-doubt. It's therapeutic to see yourself clearly and to... Give yourself the same kind of support that you would back your own play. You would invest in yourself because it's a worthy investment, much like you would want to invest in another person. Fourth, to realize that recognizing the good in yourself is the path, a very important path to recognizing the good in others and to giving totally. them that pro-social. Yeah, this is a really, really big one, I think. Yeah. That like a lot of the time... Mm -hmm. This becomes a little bit of a scarcity mindset thing, yeah. actually, where we view praise as a scarce resource. And so if somebody else is getting praised, then we're not getting praised. Or if we feel inadequate inside of ourselves, we can project some of those inadequacies onto other people. And certainly as I've, over time, just gotten into more touch with some of my positive qualities, I think that I've been way more willing to see positive qualities in other people um, and to do what you were talking about earlier with with the the um the praising part of it and just the the recognizing uh those prizing yeah the prizing part of it and just recognizing that in other people because there's something where I'm I'm comfortable being emotionally intimate with myself so I'm comfortable being emotionally intimate with other people and those two things have really gone hand in hand then last one that comes to me and this is going to seem counterintuitive maybe it's to Go down a path in which you're both increasingly loving in an unconditional way. You're moving through the world with a kind of warm-hearted, spacious presence as the field in which activity is occurring and you're having meetings and you're encountering people. So you're, you're more and more, this is doable. You're developing in this way on the one hand, while on the other hand, becoming less and less uh, implicated in other people's mind streams, less and less bound to their reactions to you. It's really interesting. So you're less and less bound to how other people see you. You know, you take it into account, you're interested in it as information, but it doesn't um, usually move you strongly one way or another. Shanti Deva, you know, a Tibetan teacher a thousand years ago or mm -hmm. so, he, he said, Yes, people praise me, but I know that inevitably people will criticize me. And yes, while people criticize me, I know that inevitably some other people will praise me. And it's becoming increasingly free of praise and blame, essentially, uh, from other people. So you move toward wanting to recognize the good in yourself and whatever, man. <laughs> you know, if they have a problem with that, that's their problem. Many, many people are are kind of a hot mess. And uh, are we gonna govern ourselves and regulate ourselves and play small and live in fear of of their of how they might see us? And then, you know, we, there's also the super deep level. Um, 
Someone quoted the Rumi poem to me earlier today, and to paraphrase it, the thing about there is, you know, there is a space beyond right and wrong, good and bad, and in that garden we can meet. Hmm. Something like that. In the Patreon notes, you'll probably put a, a really good uh, correct I will pull the actual yeah. Rumi poem, yes, yeah, for sure. Yeah, that's right. Underneath it all, underneath all these appraisals of ourselves, the, what do you see when you look deeply inside? And when people look deeply inside, they see awareness. They see a level of being that feels deeper than personality, deeper than gender. The deepest layer of your being is it gendered. It doesn't feel like that. Is it even Forrest or Rick in a personality sense? It feels deeper than that. Sure. Right? And yeah. we could get into the ont ontological status of that. Is it a soul? Nature of the self. Uh, sure, whatever. But totally. just experientially, yeah. you go down and you go, mm -hmm. wow, there's wakefulness. There is kind of a natural benevolence. Very few people wake up in the morning thinking, how can I hurt somebody today? Mm. Right? They mm. don't, we don't. Yeah. There's a natural yeah. movement to constructing, to building, to helping rather than hurting. Well, we're, we're sliding into a human nature conversation here, Dad, uh, which is great because I love human nature conversations. But uh, one of the things that I think can actually get in the way of people waking up to their good news, you know, their positive qualities, mm -hmm. connecting with that underlying good nature, seeing the good about themselves, their good intentions, their good attributes, all of that stuff that we just talked about, is just a lot of, lot of traditions in the world that are very focused on the idea that human nature is fundamentally bad. And a lot of people are raised inside of those traditions or raised inside of structures. I mean, you look at uh, early, early 20th century psychology, Freud, basically believed that humans were savages and that our job was to constrain our savage nature through a lot of extreme top-down regulation of our impulses. And you can really interpret the last 50 years of psychology as an increasing movement away from that worldview. Um, and that as, as time has gone on, people have moved more and more toward a a more, a more naturalistic view or a more positivist view maybe of human nature. And so but nonetheless, those those systems perpetuate, right? Those there are people who still have those worldviews. They're still very, very uh, present in the popular culture. And so, if you've been enraised in them, if you've received a lot of messages early on of like people are fundamentally untrustworthy, then you're probably going to develop a view of nature as being problematic and dark, and therefore may might be a little concerned about what you find when you look inside of yourself. True, and I think also we tend to infer about ourselves from what we see around us. Yeah. So if totally. we see people around us for all kinds of reasons being selfish and yeah, cruel absolutely. and totally. nasty, we think, oh, I, I guess I'm like that myself. And yet, if you really observe in effect your body, when you when you come down again to the roots of who you are, which is this evolved biological process that has you know, continuity hopefully for 80 or 100 years, what's the nature of your body? Does it want to take the next breath? Yes. Does it want to move away from pain and rest in well-being? Yes. As an enormously social body, does it want to affiliate and attach with others? Yeah. Right? Is it moved toward learning? It actually is, or uh, dopamine-based systems that uh, release with novelty. There's a term about children. They, they naturally have what's called mastery motivation. They wanna get good at stuff. Our, our bodies want to do these things. Yes, our bodies are capable of holding weapons and killing and harming and, and engaging in you know, destructive behaviors of one kind or another, and yeah, but those are the exceptions. The rule is, is a basic kind of positive, constructive, helpful, uh, well-being seeking en engagement in the world that comes right out of our own biology. That's native to us. You know, when, you, when we start encountering these questions, I, of course, got curious about this when doing prep for this episode because mm -hmm. I can't help myself. Um, yeah. And I just did a little bit of a dive into like, well, what do people say about this on a research level? And the, the difficulty, of course, is in separating what you're speaking to, Dad, which is like, what is truly beneath it all? 
from people's behavior out in the world. Because of course we know that people do horrible things all of the time, and so how can you see that horrible behavior and think of human nature as being fundamentally positive? You know, these are questions that people have grappled with for thousands and thousands of years. We're certainly not going to answer them on this episode of the podcast. But anyways, I'm just acknowledging that there are these two different levels here. There was a very, very interesting study that was done by Rand, Green, and Noark that was published in the journal Nature in uh, 2012 that found that when people were forced to make a decision quickly and intuitively, they tended to be more cooperative. Or, but if they were given enough time to make a decision more deliberatively, they tended to be a little bit more selfish. Some of those cooperative tendencies got ameliorated by something else, who knows. Um, and that kind of suggests that we're intuitively pro-social. And this isn't the only study that's find this. There's a lot of research that suggests that people default to cooperation. But the big modifier of this whole thing is something that I want to ask you about that you alluded to earlier. We're very early in the conversation, you said, I think that one of the big things that there is for us to do out in the world these days is to see the good in other people, particularly other people who look different from us. Because what we find over and over again in research is the power of in-group similarity. That yes, people are generally motivated to be cooperative, giving, supportive, willing to, to incur a small cost to give the group a big benefit, if that group looks like them, mm -hmm. if that group is part of various in-group similarity identifiers, whether looks means literal, uh, your racial or ethnic background, or looks as like the political party that you're a part of, or the religious group you're a part of. Um, and we're a lot less willing to do that when people aren't part of those same in-groups as we are. And this leads me personally to a view of behavior, kind of separate maybe from deep nature, as being neither good nor bad, but profoundly tribal. And I'm not offering a, a unique view there, that's a view that's been posited by a lot of people who've done a lot more research on this than I have. Um, but just taking a quick look at things like, wow, that's really what it looks like over and over again, particularly when you start to delve into cognitive biases and the ways in which those are profoundly tribal, all of that good stuff. So that's my own view of behavior in terms of nature out in the world. And I know that you've been thinking about this a lot, Dad, so I'm wondering if you've got any reflections after that, uh, that little mm. monologue of mine. I think you're right. And I think <laughs> Karl Great Marx. Great starting point. I'd love to hear it. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. And I think Karl Marx was right too. And what I mean by that is that, you know, I, I think who was it we had? Yes, it was Gabor. I think it was Gabor uh, Mate. Yeah. Uh, we talked, or I'm not sure if the episode's released yet. That episode hasn't published yet. That's actually going to go live in like September or something. But preview for people, we talked to Gabor Mate around his new book. It was a wonderful conversation, and I'm really excited for the embargo on that going up so that we can publish it. Yeah, so a bit of a preview. He um, qu quoted someone, and in, in the parable, basically, uh, you know, of where there's an old fish and young fish, and a bunch of young fish, you know, swim by the old fish, and the old fish says, "Howdy, how's the water today?" And they grunt and they swim on past, and then one of them turns to another and says, "What's water?" Right, and then Gabor took it to another level. He said, "What about if you have a petri dish with a culture medium in it, in which you're trying to grow various microbes? And if you take a you know healthy collection of bacteria of some kind, and they do not flourish in the petri dish, you ask yourself, what's wrong with the culture? What's wrong with the culture medium? And we are very shaped in ways we don't often realize because it's the water we swim in by the means of production, as Marx talked about it. Econ the, so the economic systems we're embedded in, the cultural systems we're embedded in, just the presumptions of everyday life that we're embedded in that really affect us and constrain who we can be. Delicious. And it makes me think about Almost Famous, one of the great movies in which, gonna, <laughs> you know the line. Love that movie. Yeah, where something like this grizzled person says to the young kid, uh, the only real currency in this life is what we say to each other when we're not trying to be cool. Yeah. Or close to it. Yeah. And so we're very affected and it, we're constrained in our sense of the possible. If you want to oppress people, um, constrain their sense of the possible. The possible in terms of how they are, of, of who they are, and the possible in terms of how they can be with each other or what they can see in each other or what is possible even to imagine or dream. And we're very affected 
by our culture. So I think that's part of it, including the ways in which culture and politics and circumstances uh, often manipulated by authoritarian demagogues of various stripes throughout history, you know, push that tribalistic um, style. All that said, you know, my rant here uh, is that I just think we think too small. We, we accept a smallifying that's baked into these larger systems in many, many ways, because that's what produces docile workers and, you know, hungry consumers that drive the machine. And it's revolutionary to stand up and think big, to see big, and to see good in a large scale. And I just think that it's so important to stand up for who we all really are, to stand up for who that person across from you sitting on the bus, tired at the end of a long day, who they really are. Yeah? And part of that is to stand up for who you really are as well. Not as some self-congratulatory BS form of you know, narcissism and arrogance and, oh, look at me, my brand is sincerity. <laughs> like, what? <laughs> you know? <laughs> <laughs> it's so yeah, wrong my brand is authenticity, no, absolutely. but as an act of courage, right? Mm. You read fiction, it's easy to have a, a bad ending. Uh, you know, like your hero's rolling along, do, does a good job, and then suddenly, boom, an asteroid kills him. Like, that's easy. <laughs> that's easy to have a credible, happy ending. That takes a lot of courage to, to, mm. to really write that in a way that's credible for us. So to me, it's about courage. Courage. To see the good in yourself and to stand up for it, no matter what they say, and to see the good in other people and to stand up, you know, for that as well, even if they give you a lot of denial about it, you see it mm. in them. I mean, I thought it was great for starters, and it's uh, sometimes we have these episodes where I've got like my my nice little <laughs> summary outline of it, and just by the third sentence, there's a bomb has gone off in the outline. It's everywhere. It's on the <laughs> walls, you know. <laughs> you just walk in and you're like, no, man, here's what we're doing. <laughs> and I, I got totally carried by that today. And I, I, I really enjoyed it personally. I hope the listeners did as well. <laughs> um, and so to be clear, no complaints, but it's one of those things where it's like, wow, this is not what I was expecting to talk about today. But hey, I'm here for whenever we can get a Mark shout out on the podcast and do it in a way that feels authentic <laughs> to, the, to the other work we're doing here. Uh, but okay, so all that said, and I think that that's a great framing for, for the value of this process of connecting with the positive aspects of the interior. And you've already named some ways that people can do that. For starters, feeling down into their core nature, something that lies beneath it all. Then we did that exercise where we walked to you together. Like, what can you really name about yourself? What can you name about your positive intentions and your positive attributes and your positive efforts out in the world? Um, and then you mentioned prizing. Can you prize other people? Can you prize yourself? So these are already a lot of different techniques that you've gone through through the episode. Um, but I'm wondering here at the end, do you think that there are some other ways that people can take that brave step that you were sort of talking about there to seeing the good in themselves or seeing the good in other people? Like, what do you think supports people in that? You said something about 10 minutes ago, just important and quick. Hmm. That was basically about intimacy. That was the word you yeah. used. Mm -hmm. and Emotional be, intimacy. Yeah. yeah, to be intimate with ourselves and to be intimate with the other person when we are intimate with ourselves and intimate with the other person, clear seeing naturally naturally follows. We start to recognize what's there and valuing of it. We can engage in appreciative inquiry into ourselves and with other people. And also a lovingness. It's stupid. The person who's in popular culture, certainly in America, who's loving, pro-social, see the good in other people kind of person is represented as a sort of chump. Maybe a nice chump, but basically a chump. The, you know, the people who really have got the goods, people who really see things clearly are cynical, despairing, and really grumpy. Well, to me, that's the coward's way out. It's easy to be despairing. It's easy to be critical. That's a cheap thing. It's cheap to take those shots. But to see the good and to build the good and go for the good, including the big long-term good, I, I think of it as courage. I think courage is totally the right word. I think it's it's the perfect word, actually. Um, because for me, 
There is a certain, I'm reaching for words during this conversation for some reason, and, and it's because I think this stuff is hard to put into language, but there, there is a fear associated with this, almost always for me, and I think for other people as well, where there, there is a fear to see our positive aspects sometimes. There is a concern with reaching into the soft underbelly um, because we feel the feelings there. We feel the fear, we feel the sadness, we feel the the sensitivity, the vulnerability. And and I think that, that that fear and and the pain of change that is often associated with it is just the price for entry here. It's it's the price for entry to play the game. And whether the game is the game of self-development, the game of seeing the good in other people, seeing the good in yourself, it's the price to play. Um and so there is a courage associated with that, where it is a brave act to see those positive aspects of yourself and to equally to see them in other people a lot of the time. Um, and so I think that courage is exactly the right word, and it, it takes courage to go through that process. So yeah, developing that and understanding that the first couple of times it's going to feel uncomfortable and weird is, I think, a very useful thing to come to terms with. I think also people have this fear, I've, I've encountered many times, that uh, a person will not want to recognize some strength they have because then they feel there would be the burden of responsibility to do something about it, to yeah, manifest it sure. out in the world, totally. oh, to, to be recognized, oh, you have a musical talent. Oh, wow, now I need to start a band. You know? <laughs> and the yeah, issue there totally. is this common pattern for us that really – uh, gates growth and really flattens people's healing and development. And the structure of it is, well, if X, therefore must also be Y. No, you can recognize a musical talent and decide to just piddle around with your guitar. That's it. It's okay. You don't have to do Y, or it doesn't necessarily mean Y, or you're or the Y of other people, how they might treat you, isn't necessarily going to happen. Um, and that's made up in your own mind. And this is a generalization that people can take away when they look at themselves. Uh, the yes, but. Well, yes, but why? Well, no, not necessarily. Just yes. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm not totally sure how to, how to bring this, how to wrap this one up in a tidy way, because <laughs> I feel like we went so many different places with it. But I really loved having this conversation. I think it was super useful for me uh, personally, including the ways in which we can connect with the courage aspect of it, of what we're doing here, as itself a positive aspect that you could come more into relationship with, right? And as you can tune into that part of yourself, maybe it allows you to fuel the rest of this process of connecting with those underlying positive impulses. There's something that's so tender in this, and there's something tender. You you see the person sitting across from you in the bus. You don't know them, and you can just see they're tired, their back hurts, they're vulnerable. And still, they're not organized around hurting and harming other people. They're, they're probably, sure. maybe they have a kid at home or they have an agent. They're doing parent. the best they can. Yeah. yeah. And to cherish that other being in this perishing world and to have that feeling of cherishing, it takes courage to come into relationships in that way. And what you and I are talking about is ways in which we can also encourage other people to be more cherishing, including cherishing of us. You know, to ask another person, will you cherish me? That's so scary to ask for that too. Yeah. And yet, well, that's something we could do. Well, I think that that's as good a place as any to close our conversation today. So thanks so much for doing this uh, with me today, Dad. I think it was a really interesting one. Today we talked about how we can accept and appreciate and get in touch with the positive aspects of our nature. And we started maybe a little ironically with a slightly negative topic, which is all the stuff that gets in the way of us doing that. And maybe a little predictably, I'm becoming a parody of myself here, uh, I went pretty developmental with all of this. We get told early on in life that we're a certain kind of way by parents and caregivers, teachers, other kids, and we're just a kid, and kids are very moldable. So we take them very seriously, and we internalize those stories as part of our self-identity. There's also something called the anchoring bias, which is our tendency to over-infer from early experiences. So if, again, as a kid, we have early experiences that just due to random chance or variation, bad circumstance, whatever, 
of something not going so well for us, we tend to overlearn from them. A classic example of this is somebody who struggles early on in math and just starts to think to themselves, oh, I'm bad at math. But you're actually not bad at math at all. You just had a bad math teacher or for you were a little younger than the other kids in your class. So what you were learning wasn't perfectly developmentally appropriate or whatever else. Then we might have fears about being the nail that stands up to steal the Japanese proverb. Narcissism is a real hot button topic these days. And I think that there are probably a lot of people out there who are really hypersensitive around being perceived as conceited or egotistical. Uh, I know that certainly that's something that I never want to be perceived as. And that can actually cut people off from being able to go, yeah, I am authentically just good at that, which is great. That's a positive thing, right? That I'm good at this thing. And it's not this egotistical statement. It's just a fact statement and it's a reality. And it allows that person to lean into the things that they are authentically good at which then probably make them more successful out in the world as time goes on. Then something we've talked about a lot on the podcast, we might have banished aspects of the self. Uh, we have early experiences all the time where aspects of ourselves that might be really useful in adulthood get punished out of us in childhood. Examples of this might be that you were an outgoing kid, that you were really sweet, that you were emotionally sensitive, or maybe you had a, a fiery nature that allowed you to be really energetic in pursuit of a goal. And we could see how all of those things might be really great to have as an adult, but they also might get punished sometimes as a kid, either directly punished by our parents or they're just sort of generally punished by other kids in the slightly Lord of the Flies style environments that describe most elementary schools and middle schools probably. And so now as an adult, you might be looking back and going, hey, I could use a little more of that these days. But when we're punished, that creates internal systems that cause us to be discouraged from reconnecting to that material. Then finally, we might be carrying around views about the nature of the self that are stopping us from getting in touch with our own positive qualities. A really common view of human nature, found both in many religious traditions and in a lot of philosophy, is that humans are fundamentally immoral, uh, chaotic, feral animals who need to strongly regulate their bad impulses with a lot of top-down psychological control. And it's really easy for us to internalize that view, particularly if you were brought up in a born-in-sin style tradition. And if that view is true, then looking into the underbelly of the psyche or connecting with your internal material can almost inherently be pretty fraught with peril. And one way to interpret my take during the early part of the episode on self-awareness that we referenced early on in this episode is that I was getting a bit too carried away by that perspective. We then spent a little while talking about, well, what is human nature? And what most research finds is that humans are intuitively pro-social. When forced to make a choice rapidly, they tend to make the more cooperative one. But when people are given time to reflect, that's when those more selfish tendencies tend to come in. The big modifier inside of research is in-group similarity. Research consistently finds in-group preference in almost all behavior. We're much more likely to be good to people who are like us in some way. And my personal view of this whole territory is that it's much more useful to think about our nature as tribal rather than good or bad. And there are things that we can, of course, do actively inside of our minds to become a little less tribal over time and to be aware of those tendencies so we don't fall into them as readily. We then talked for a while practically about what we can do to connect to those parts of our interior that we really like, the things that are, are authentically good about who we are. A few different ways we can do this. One of them is by changing our internal narrative. How are we turning our positive aspects into problematic ones based on the stories that we're telling about ourselves? And how can we change those stories a little bit so that the things that we've set up as problems now get positioned as positive aspects? Then we can have a general stance of reclaiming our interior. Uh, we can have a desire to see our own fullness just as we see the fullness of other people and we cannot get bound up in a very narrow story about who we are, which is often one that is tinged with negativity because the brain has a bias toward negativity. And then maybe this is just me, 
But my own experience is that discomfort is the price of entry for change. And it's kind of funny to think that even connecting with our positive aspects is uncomfortable. But the reality is that all change is uncomfortable. For me personally, my life changed enormously when I let myself go through the uncomfortable experience of feeling all of my emotions and accepting all of my interior. That was a big process for me, and it was not an enjoyable one, even though it ultimately had so many positive impacts on my life as a whole. And so we can just accept. We can accept that discomfort is part of the process. We can accept that looking into our experiences, even if we find beautiful things there, is often an emotionally fraught process. And then, of course, we develop the strengths over time that allow us to go through that process and, and bear that discomfort. I really enjoyed having this conversation with Rick. It was super helpful for me personally. And if you've been enjoying the podcast, we'd appreciate it if you would take a moment to subscribe through the platform of your choice, maybe leave a rating, a positive review, and hey, you can always tell a friend about the show. If you'd like to support us in other ways, you can find us on Patreon. It's patreon.com slash being well podcast and for just a couple dollars a month you can support the show and get a bunch of bonuses in return things like expanded show notes transcripts and ad-free versions of the episodes until next time thanks for listening and i'll talk to you soon